Well, now it gets bloody interesting. I love this bit. So, who are they? Who are they? Who is this non-human race that all these ancient cultures and legends talk about um, interbred with humanity to create this hybrid bloodline and indeed change the gen genetics of the human form? Well, over the last kind of, I guess, 10, 12 years, this information started to come in and it's coming all over the world now. The key ones uh, seem to take a reptilian form. And uh, of course, we, 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 we decode a tiny frequency range within infinity and we think that we know it all. And because it's different to what we are used to, then it can't exist, it must be crazy. It's an interesting fact that if you want to control people's perception of what's possible, then you just limit the information they receive about what is possible. It's real simple. And then they'll believe what's possible is what they've been told is possible. And so they will dismiss by reflex action, laugh and snigger at something that is happening just because it's different. Because they're stuck in mind. Now DNA is a software program. It holds different information, just like different software programs do. And this hybrid DNA, this reptilian human DNA, shall we say, uh, the royal bloodlines and uh, the other effects on all of us, although lesser than the pure ones, um, is a software program which is information which therefore affects not only the way we perceive reality, it affects the way we decode reality. And I would say firewalls the computer in the way I was talking earlier. And it's interesting, the fall of man symbolically was caused by what? A snake. And what, you know, I was on a Christian radio station last year and they were going on, this reptilian load of rubbish. I said, really? Do you believe the Bible? Oh, I believe the Bible. I said, well, do you think the snake in the Garden of Eden, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, was literally a snake talking to Adam and Eve? Do you actually believe that was exactly what it is? Uh, or do you think it might be symbolic for something else? Um, and it kind of did make some of them think, oh, well, hold on a second, yeah. And it's funny how, you know, people dismiss some of the things that people think because they're crazy, but, and then they, again, it's cognitive dissonance. They don't look at what they're saying. I'm not saying they shouldn't believe it, believe what you like, it's a human right, but, um, I mean, please look at your own beliefs before you start writing off others as crazy. And what this interbreeding did was affect the human DNA and it put 
a bigger reptilian input into it. And interestingly, the caduceus, which is now the symbol of the medical profession, is a symbol of the DNA and enlightenment, kundalini and all that stuff, and it's symbolized as, a, as snakes. And the snake symbolism and the serpent symbolism around the world is absolutely unbelievable. Before I got into this, I wasn't aware of it, but of course you do research and you follow it through. The serpent symbolism in religions and cultures and bloodlines and origins of kings and queens all over the world is absolutely staggering. This is a, 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 a painting of uh, uh, one of these reptilian entities um, from ancient modern descriptions, although there are many versions, just like they are humans by Credo Mutwa, the Zulu shaman, who I'll get to uh, shortly. And this is a, a symbolic painting by Neil Haig of this hybrid bloodline. And uh, they became known also as the demigods, you know, part human, part god, because of this interbreeding. And <laughs> this change in the DNA, again the snake, did something to the human form and its ability to connect. I would suggest the more that I go into this, and I'm gathering more and more information all the time by the day now, it seems to be this area is coming into my life a lot. It's like firewalling off a computer to limit what it can perceive and decode. And for me, the fall of man, as it is described, was a fall down the frequencies, or at least a fall down the range of frequencies that we could um, perceive as a matter of course. Because, of course, you'll see cats and other animals reacting to what is to us empty space. What's the cat doing? There's nothing there. Well, there is to the cat. Because it's got a wider visual frequency range it can access. It sees more than we do. That's why it's reacting to what is to us empty space. And this firewall affected, because it was affecting the DNA, which is the receiver transmitter and the crystalline system also, um, the, our ability to decode reality. Um, and therefore, make it more difficult to hold a connection to consciousness while we're in this mind reality, this virtual reality. And so for me anyway, I mean people just have to make their own minds up on this stuff, it's just information. Um, the exclusion from the garden, symbolically, something else that you find around the world, not just in the Bible, long before the Bible, the exclusion of Adam and Eve from the garden was the exclusion from um, realities that, they could, uh, that humans could access before, because Adam and Eve is symbolic of, 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 of a, a human uh, form, They're not kind of individuals necessarily. Now, the worship of the serpent, official mainstream science and anthropology, is the oldest form of worship. It's been uh, taken back so far 70,000 years, which certainly fits, and then some, with the Sumerian tablets time scale of when the uh, Anunnaki came. They, uh, these tablets connect the Anunnaki to their kings going back 240,000 years. Because this golden age wasn't, you know, a week on Tuesday and with there's an R in the month, it was a long period of life on earth which history has um, shut out, official history. And um, 70,000 years ago, people in South Africa, what called the sand people, the bush people, bushmen, were worshipping the serpent uh, as a god. And all these different groups in these different uh, cultures when you go into it, you go, oh my goodness me, you had no idea to you look at this, how universal this was. The Druids, um, they worshipped a serpent god called Hugh. And so Hugh man actually translates in that uh, interpretation as serpent man. And the, 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 the under different names, the serpent gods and the ser serpent god are just universal. Now in... Um, the same area where Sumer, this very advanced civilization, uh, appeared around 4000 uh, BC, something like that, through to 2000 BC around then. Before that, in the same area of Mesopotamia, was something called the Ubaid people, the Ubaid culture. And uh, in their graves have been found these serpent images of their gods. And 
Many of them are holding um, babies, like the mother and child, which will become uh, maybe um, interesting later on. Um, and uh, it's also interesting that these uh, reptilian gods were supposed to have elongated skulls. And uh, again, as seen in that image from the Ubaid period, thousands and thousands of years BC. And there have been uh, skulls found that have this incredible um, elongated um, skull. And uh, there's another one there, the skull that was found. And the Egyptians, for instance, among others, they um, depicted their gods and, and, and goddesses with elongated skulls. Now, of course, there are people, uh, again, another one, with, with the, the big hats, the, the high hats, the elongated uh, skull that you see uh, so often in Egypt. Now, you do find this among some uh, native peoples where they take the children and they uh, bind their heads, I mean, God, the thought of it, so tightly uh, from a birth and it elongates the skull. And when they're asked why they do this, um, they say, and Craig and Mutchwood told me a lot about what goes on in Africa from that point of view, they say it's to make our children like the gods. Again, it's um, this carryover from the, the gods with the elongated skulls. Now, one of the uh, ways that they symbolized these bloodlines and these gods as part human, part snake, was like this. You see loads of these where it's part human and the rest is like a snake or a serpent. These are <clears throat> kind of endless numbers of these images all around the world in different cultures. And here's another example um, where you're human and then you are part serpent. This is the hybrid bloodline that um, I'm talking about, symbolized in ancient architecture, etc. You get the symbolism of the people, humans, fighting giant snakes, again, all... Um, symbolic. There again is a goddess who becomes in the lower half a snake. Uh, there you get the story of, of humans fighting the snake and all the rest of it. Um, symbolic of this. Again the cobra and the symbol of the cobra is, is a, an Illuminati um, uh, symbol in many many ways and going way back it's a, 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 a symbol in Egypt where the, the, the cobra is symbolized in the way that they symbolize their pharaohs, etc. It uh, says here, beard styled uh, to resemble underbelly of cobra. Uh, cobra emerging from the top of the head. Um, headdress like the cobra. Uh, and wherever you go, and I've been researching this now for the best part of a decade, um, it, it's unbelievable. And the other interesting thing cause where, of where we're going is at least there came a time, if not from the start, when the worship of the sun and the worship of the serpent kind of became one uh, and moved as one unit. Beca it's like, a, it's like the, the reptilian hybrid religion, the worship of the sun and the worship of the moon goddess, etc. Again, here we have the, the cobra symbol of a, a god in, or goddess in another part of the world. Um, and you, you see them all over the place. And somebody sent me these um, uh, statue images, again, of the, the, the symbolism of the serpent and, and the human woman, the uh, interbreeding, and the, again, the dual um, hybrid nature, part human, part serpent, part human, part serpent. And these um, gargoyles that you see on the stately homes and castles of these elite bloodlines, again, symbolic of these entities. The dragon or the, the serpent you find as a regular symbol on the coats of arms of these uh, families. Uh, the uh, crest of the City of London, the city by City of London I mean the, the financial district of London, um, the original London before it became the great sprawl it is today, that is the um, two flying dragons holding the red cross on the white background which is the shield of the Knights Templar secret society which is massively part of this network of secret societies. It's a closer look at it. When you go into the city of London you pass these flying reptiles on both sides of the road holding those shields. At the point where the city of London meets something called the Temple and it's called the Temple in London because it's named after the Knights Templar Temple um, 
where those two very important uh, areas of London meet in terms of global control and manipulation, you have this big um, reptile in the middle of the road at a place known as uh, Temple Bar. Again, the, the, the dragon and the, the serpent uh, monster and all the rest of it is universal around the world. Of course, in the East, like in uh, China and Japan, etc., it's the national symbol, the dragon. And the ancient Chinese emperors used to claim the right to be emperor because of their uh, descendants from what they called the serpent gods. Again, it goes on and on and on. Uh, Messiah comes from Mesa, uh, apparently, according to some researchers, and Christ means anointed one. And the, it, the Mesa is the crocodile, the Nile crocodile, and they used to use the fat of the Nile crocodile to anoint uh, people in ceremonies uh, in Egypt and that oil is still used, the, the symbolism of the oil and, and, and so much Middle Eastern and um, um, Israel um, symbolism and names and what have you when we crown the, the monarch of Britain. In the Bible the, uh, the Satan figure, whatever you want to call him, um, is described in dragon terms and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out unto into the earth and his angels were cast out with him now that great dragon the god the god the druid god you was known as the great dragon ruler of the world to the druids so credo mutwa great friend of mine when i first met him um was in South Africa in the late 90s, I think it's about 98. And um, I met him and we had a chat. We haven't talked about any of this stuff, but other things. And then I went back just after I published a book called The Biggest Secret. And he's on the phone as soon as I get there saying, I must talk to you. How do you know about the Chittahuri? Uh, who the hell are the Chittahuri? Well, the Chittahuri, because The Biggest Secret was the first book I wrote where I introduced this whole reptilian theme. The Chittahuri in South African uh, legend are the children of the serpent or the children of the python. They are this hybrid bloodline known as the Chittahuri in South Africa. And I talked to him, and I, I did a DVD of about six and a half hours talking to him about this, and he's telling me all the African legends that he learned in, in his um, development as a shaman over like 50 years or more, he's, he's in his late 80s now, and they mirrored what I was finding out all over the world. And he showed me um, uh, artifacts he had, like this necklace of the mysteries, as he calls it. Not really a necklace, it goes on the shoulders and it's so bloody heavy. I don't know how it is, AG bloody walks around with it, but he does sometimes. Um, and on the necklace of the mysteries are these symbols through which he is the official storyteller of the Zulu nation and the official historian of the Zulu nation. Um, uh, he tells the story of the development of people in Africa, African people. And the pride of place at the front is this human woman and this clearly non-human entity with a big willy, which, he told me, used to be golden until someone stole it and they couldn't afford to replace the gold, so a copper one was put in its place. Now that, from South Africa, mirrors the story, the big story at the heart of Egyptian myth, of the golden penis of Osiris, which was also told, in effect, about Nimrod, the Osiris figure in Babylon, who I'll certainly come to as we go along, because it's very, very important to understanding so much about what's going on today. And these stories are uh, relating, that he tells, uh, from the legends of an interbreeding between a non-human race, the Chittahuri, and human women to create a hybrid bloodline. There's the human woman, there's the non-human entity. Now why does it look like that? This is the reason why at best these entities and their hybrids are symbolized by snakes and, and, and animals like the serpent in the Garden of Eden because according to legend the Chittahuri said you, to the people you must never depict us as we really look. So what they did, they used kind of snake symbolism or they made them look absolutely ludicrously not human to show that we're not talking about human interbreeding but uh, non-human human interbreeding. Now on the side of uh, Credo's uh, hut, he has uh, painted this picture um, of a, a snake um, eating a human um, at, from African legends about the Chittahuri eating humans. And uh, it's interesting. 
that you find that on the Alfa Romeo symbol alongside the red cross on the white background which is the Knights Templar Secret Society. And um, in the garden of Silvio Berlusconi, the leader of Italy, God knows how, were they all drunk, um, uh, you have um, the same thing of the snake eating a human. And this is from ancient myth about the Chittahuri. Now a lot of these fairy stories about frogs turning into princes and all that stuff um, are all linked to these kind of legends about this interbreeding and this hybrid race. And it's amazing what you find. This is a book in America, I think a series of books someone was telling me, but certainly one book, uh, for children. It's, it's, it's in the schools and it's about shape-shifting reptilians between human and reptilian, which these bloodlines in their purest form, mind, can do. And, you know, throughout history, and cultures all over the world, you see, not just reptilian, but in many different forms, you see the story of shape-shifting. Now, when I started meeting people all over the world, I mean, I don't go looking for this, but I started meeting people from about 96, 97, who all over the world, who were telling me stories about how they'd experienced seeing someone who looked human and turning into a reptilian figure and then going back again. And you think, hold on, when you hear one or two, you go, ooh, ooh. Not sure about that. So you stick it on the back burner, and as I do, and I, I wait and see where it goes. Well, where it went was loads of other stories around the world of the same thing. Now, this is why the first part of today was so important, because if we don't understand the nature of reality and its illusory physicality, then, you know, people say, you can't go from physical body to physical body and back again. No, you can't. I absolutely agree with you. But that's not what happens. The only place the shape shift happens is in your head, in the decoding system. When you have an energy field shift, then you are decoding an energy field like, uh, you know, the energy uh, form into the holographic form. And then when that energy field shifts, which is not solid, it's movable because it's energy, then you start to decode a different form of that energy. And to your perception, you see a, a, a apparently solid body human, then you see it reptilian, sometimes other forms as well, and then you see it human again. And of course, without understanding the nature of reality, you go, that's impossible. No, it's not. It's all gone on in your head. Just like flicking a television channel uh, zapper button from one uh, to another. Now, oh, hey, that's kind of relevant, isn't it? She should come up. Um, I, I'm not getting a knighthood, by the way, in Britain. I think, I, I, I think it's when I said she, she was a Satanist to shape-shifted reptilian. I think, I think that cost me in the end. I'm not sure. So, that we, the physical form is a hologram. It's not solid, and that's why it can shift if you know what you're doing. Because it happens in there, within this short frequency range. So, these entities, these reptilian entities, appear to exist just outside, as a matter of course, outside of visible light. So, in the natural course of events, what we're decoding is that which exists within, within visible light. So we, we see humans everywhere. But just outside of visible light are entities that are anything but, but human. And this is where we see ghostly figures too. The reason a ghost looks ethereal rather than solid is it's not quite on the same frequency that we are. So when you get two radio stations that are not quite on the dial, you don't get sharp reception, you get what we call interference. This is a visual version of interference. And if we were on the same wavelength as the quote ghost, it would look as solid as, as you and me do. But, but, but because it's not, it looks ethereal. And this is a, a thing that uh, has been a, a constant theme through this period since this subject entered my life. And that is a, a psychic people whose visual acuity is, is, is outside the norm, who've told me how they've seen reptilian type, ethereal type entities connected to, to um, people in human form through these lower two vortex points, what we call chakra points. Um, and of course, one of the great themes throughout history um, and ancient peoples, right up to today, is that of possession. Possession by demonic entities that take over a person's mental, emotional, and therefore physical 
uh, responses, perceptions, etc. And I started to understand why these hybrid, this hybrid DNA, these bloodlines were necessary. These entities operate just outside of visible light. As I said earlier, if I'm going to interact with this reality, I need a form within this reality to interact with it. So what they've done is created hybrid bloodlines which have a vibrational resonance because of the uh, genetic makeup to these entities which means they can make a vibrational possession with these particular bloodlines much more powerfully than they can with the general population, which all of us have tremendous reptilian genetics, I'll get to in a minute, but these bloodlines are and then some. And so this seems to be the game. You use your secret society network to manipulate these hybrid bloodlines into power, and as they go into power, what's really going into power is the entity possessing the, uh, the physical body. But because we're only decoding reality within the visible light sp uh, spectrum, when we look at these people, we see physical bodies. We see human George Bush. We see human Queen of, Queen of England. But if you could just tease out just beyond visible light, you would see overshadowing these people something very, very, uh, anything but human. And so these people are in, th th that end up in these positions of power, a lot of them anyway, are, are vehicles. And so these, these are what I call come and go politicians who just come and go and all the rest of it. But all they are are vehicles to allow these entities to manipulate this reality through their outer vehicle. So you have the politicians in the dark suits, then you have the shadow people, the advisors and all those people that have the real power in human form. And then you have behind them these entities that operate just outside of visible light and possess these entities and control their mental and emotional processes. And one important thing to stress, which will make a lot of sense of the world, is that one aspect of, one key aspect of this hybrid DNA, this pure one, this one that's more reptilian than general population, is that they don't have the most important balancer of behavior and that is empathy if I have empathy with someone who's going to suffer the consequences of my actions that empathy stops me taking those actions if I do not have the ability to empathize because that has been deleted from the program then anything goes starving children in a world of plenty because of the way I manipulate the economy, I have no emotional consequence for that because I have no empathy with that, those people. Same with kids killed in Gaza. Look, it's gone back to Vietnam and before and bombing cities full of civilians. To us who have empathy, wouldn't even consider it horrific, grotesque, my God. But without empathy, there is no emotional problem whatsoever. And so what we're looking at seems more and more clear to me is that these particular bloodlines that end up in the positions of power and behind the positions of power are possessed entities. On one level they're human, but if you could see further on they'd be anything but human. Someone um, sent me this uh, picture of, off the internet with this kind of reptilian eye. I'm not saying it might be just the light, whatever, I'm not saying that, but I, I, I'm using it as, a, as an example. So many people have told me how they've seen people's eyes shift like that into a reptilian form, which seems to be the first thing to go. Uh, but full body shifts are, are uh, ridiculously common uh, uh, around the world, but of course not many people talk about it, because what do people say? You're mad. Now I've got a friend um, who's uh, an associate of, uh, an expert in eye, uh, iris development and all the rest of it in terms of the technology, I don't agree with it, the technology that uses your iris to read your code so you go through airports without going through the various checks and everything. Anyway, whatever. 
This guy who was doing this, he looked at 2,300 pairs of eyes as a result of researching this technology. He has no idea that my friend is a friend of mine or what I'm talking about. Uh, what he said to my friend is what surprised him greatly when he did this uh, research and when he's looking into eyes through microscopes, etc., is that of the 2,300 eyes he scanned, around 4% appeared to be of reptilian type and appearance. George Bush, somebody sent me that one. Again, it might be the, it might be the light, probably is, but it's very symbolic. And again, you know, we've got the Queen. Somebody uh, produced that on the front of a magazine in Britain to, uh, you know, ridicule me. I thought, thank you very much, I'll use that. And Again, symbolic, but the, all these bloodlines, these royal bloodlines, that's again a uh, depiction of a, 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 someone from royalty in the ancient world with a cobra again. It's like uh, the, the serpent and royal bloodlines go hand in hand wherever you go. There's, there's uh, Dick. There you go. Oh yeah, another thing. Um, people who've worked with satanically abused uh, people who've been put through uh, satanic ritual and uh, satanic abuse and ritual abuse, a number of them have written to me, and one of them sent me these drawings uh, with his, uh, clients, uh, his client's uh, uh, permission, of course. Um, what they do is they try to get them to bring out their inner memories and the suppressed, uh, blocked uh, memories of what happened by drawing. And um, sh this lady drew images of her, what she's experienced during these rituals. And again and again, they draw reptilian eyes and reptilian people. And again, the, the uh, idea of uh, possession, and often possession by reptilian entities, goes way, way, way back. Because the DNA is a software program, and the idea is to um, hold that software program by only interbreeding with your own kind. This is where this obsession with elite bloodlines and royal and aristocratic bloodlines and now the, the, the elite business and banking families interbreeding with each other.